Good morning, church. Great to see everybody here this morning. Uh, we know we have some people who are still down in the basement finishing up uh, breakfast. For those of you who didn't have a chance to go to the breakfast this morning, oh, you missed out. But don't worry. You didn't really miss out. You can still mm. donate. There's actually That's still some biscuits and gravy. You oh. can donate and take some biscuits and gravy. Well, there you go. If you'd like to go donate to the J team for, for uh, Spring Hill, the camp coming up next week, you can just, you can just go right now. Have your breakfast and, and uh, donate for uh, for the camp coming up. They could go and then they could run right back. Yeah. Oh, run! Please stand and join us. <laughs> Many a dream has died. Like a tree planted by the water, we never will run dry. So living water flowing through, God, we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts, flood our souls with one
word was digging deep to know your father's heart. Into your world we're reaching out to show them who you are. So living water flowing through, God we thirst for more of you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one Joy unspeakable, faith unthinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unthinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Joy unspeakable, faith unthinkable, love unstoppable, anything is possible. Just to
week about uh, what our role is on earth and who we're supposed to be. And, and you know, there are a lot of churches who say we're supposed to we're supposed to spend every single moment that we possibly can evangelizing and being a part of the church. And, and um, you know, I, I think that's good, but.
that uh, we've brought with us today that are on our hearts and minds. Who are the people that we've been thinking about this week or the situations we want to hold up? Yeah, people on the East Coast, there's lots of snow and, and lots of difficulty. The rising tides, the storm surge was causing a problem along the boardwalk t- uh, this last night. So uh, lots of houses with lots of uh, struggles and people with transportation challenges. So keep them in our prayers. Anybody else we hold up? Anybody else we're remembering situations we want to be mindful of this day? How about the people of Flint? You know, in the midst of what's going on there, as as that uh, situation becomes a, more and more um, uh, something we're aware of. Our our family went through this. Um, Gail and I did with our oldest child when we were first back into Michigan. Our parsonage that we were in um, had lead pipes, and we did some testing ourselves. Um, and uh, Gail was eight and a half months pregnant at the time when we decided we'd better check this out. And they called us. They didn't wait for the results to come back. They said, stop drinking the water now. And uh, so Becky, our oldest, was born with heavy lead poisoning. And and it became something we had to deal with as time went forward. And there have been things, you know, along the way, you you know, try to make the connections and say, yes, this caused this. You just don't know. But we know that there were things that were big challenges for us. And I know these families will face a lot. So let's keep the families of Flint in our prayers. There are many 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 people affected by this it's not small and we like the idea of pure michigan but this is anything but pure michigan isn't it so let's keep the area of flint and the whole state of michigan as we respond and figure out what's the best next thing to do who else do we pray for yes granny and poppy and and out west them in our prayers. Anybody else we're praying for? Others we hold up? Yes. them in our prayers ongoing we have a person named bev that has some surgery this week in our church let's remember that name as we pray and her husband bill as well and let's keep him in our prayers too um dan somebody from our congregation is anticipating some surgery had a shoulder problem and a shoulder replacement that so- shoulder replacement did not go well it's so a year passed and it was infected it had to be removed it's been removed but now going towards the possibility of putting a new shoulder in and the the green light is looking stronger and stronger as we move into the week um, ahead. So let's keep Dan in our prayers in the midst of that. Pardon? And Avis as well, that's right. Anybody else we hold up? Others that we're aware of that we have in our prayers and in our hearts today? Anything else going on for us? Let's come together then at the time of prayer pray together. Great and wonderful God, as we gather in this place, we come just as we are. We know that you don't require that we get our lives perfectly in order, that we clean ourselves up in any way, shape, or form, that you meet us where we are, and and you invite us to come to this great banquet that you set for us, a banquet of grace, love. Lord, help us today as we read your word and and as it is proclaimed that it will somehow speak to us and make a difference, not just while we're in this space, but just like Matt said, as we go out from this place, help us to live our lives in a different way. And Lord, hear our prayers for the other churches of our community and, and beyond that we might work together in ways that make a difference. Hear our prayers for our leaders, the local people that 
that help in our day to day lives and people in in our country and around the world that can make a huge difference in the lives of so many people in the midst of trauma and war and famine and all the challenges that are out there, Lord. Just hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Yeah, I think kids coming up now. Is that the next thing, Matt? Sure, sure that works. Come on up, you guys. Come on down. Okay. Oh, I'm so glad you have this today. I was so worried when I saw it sitting out in the other room. thought nobody would have it. Hi, everybody. It's good to see everybody. Wow. Are you enjoying the snow? No. No. Yeah. Oh, you sound like my wife. <laughs> yeah. Well, snow can be a beautiful thing, but it can also be a challenging thing. It's cold. And it's cold. That's right. Do you think there's snow in Stanley today? Do you think that's what's in here? I don't know. Snow would be an idea. I don't think it's snow. I'm kind of feeling it. It doesn't feel cold. It doesn't feel terribly heavy. So let's see what's in Stanley today. You're trying to hold a straight face. I can tell. You don't want to give anything away. <laughs> you don't even want to look at me because you're worried that, you, that I, you'll give it away. Let's see. Oh, my goodness, this is a first. I've never had anybody do this. There is air in there, right? What's in here? It's in the little thing. Oh, she. Okay, so what we got is we got a, we got a big area here. Then we have a little area here. This one. Okay, let's see what we got. Must not be real big. Oh, my goodness sake. I am not even sure what I have here. What is this? It's a finger puppet? Okay, let's put it on so I can see how it works. Let's see how it goes. Oh, is it a particular character? It's just a, like a, a, any kind of, is it a monster? No? This is, you call it Bob? Okay. All right, this is, everybody, I want you to meet Bob. Hi there, how are you? <laughs> Gee, Bobby does it pretty good. Hi, hi. Wait a minute. You guys look the same. That's pretty good for a puppet, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, all right. So, this is a puppet. You know, now, puppets are interesting because, you know, when I just said those things, was it the puppet saying it or was it me? Just a minute ago, was it the puppet talking? It was me. Because puppets are like that. We control them totally. When I was your age, do you know what my favorite kind of puppet was? Do you know what a marionette is? Um, a finger puppet. N well, it is. I, I'm not sure I knew much about finger puppets. What's a marionette? It's the kind with strings like, like uh, Pinocchio, you know? I thought those were so amazing. They seemed so lifelike and like they could really do things. But it, in the end, they were still controlled by a puppet master, somebody who controlled the strings and somebody who provided it with sound for a voice. Well, I'm here to tell you today that you guys are not puppets. It's the most amazing thing about life is that God has given us the opportunity here to live the lives that we live and there are all kinds of choices we're making every single day, even in our earliest years, even when we're very, very little, we're already making choices on our own. We're already doing things that we choose to do. And life gets more and more complicated the older we get. But God says, I want you to be the one to choose. We are not puppets. It's not God forcing us. So God loves us so much that God will allow us and take the risk that we're going to not choose well. Did you ever see anybody make a bad choice? No. Yeah. You've no. never yet? Not yet. No. Someday soon. <laughs> Someday soon. And you go, oh, that wasn't such a good choice. Anybody ever see anybody putting time out? Yeah. 
Yep. My brother. Yeah, right. So time out is someplace where our parents might put us or our teacher might put us if we make a bad choice. Well, I'm also here to tell you that we can make bad choices in life, and sometimes we get put, in a sense, in a place as a time out. But again, God has created us in such a beautiful way that we have the freedom to choose. But God, at the same time, wants for us to choose well, to choose things that are good for us and good for others. And so I want us to remember that, that you are not puppets. And that's a great thing about about our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, what a great idea for us to remind ourselves of is that we are not puppets, that we are free. But Lord, that creates a problem sometimes, that sometimes we don't do so well. But in the midst of that, you love us in and through it all the time. We thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. What a great choice. I thought for a minute we were going to do something with nothing, but you had a puppet all along. Great. Thank you, you guys. Kids are going down to, oh, we, are you our, re, oh, our readers there? Okay, you're going to do announcements. Great. Um, so as the kids go out, oh, and hopefully they don't need first aid. Um, no, but they bounce. They, they, they pop right back up again. We've got a couple of nurses in the house if need be. Um, anyway, <laughs> so with that, uh, what, what comes to me as I think about announcements, I think of what Matt was sharing about how we're here and we learn and we come together and we grow as the body of Christ and then we go out and we do things in his name and we spread that love as we, as we live in our daily lives and we live where we're at. And as I look at our announcements, they're always all in your bulletin, so I never hit all of them if you're pick one of those up. There's always a list of stuff in there, but some of the things that are there, I see this urgent need for, for Matt, for men's winter gloves. I see things about um, coffee volunteers and Sunday morning cookies for as we, as we do stuff here. I see about this youth summit of how we can come together and look at what's going on in our youth program and look at expanding that youth program into our junior high age and what we can do there. I see this underwear collection about Sarah's circle collecting those things. And we always, we have, for those of you that don't know, there's kind of some bins out here that we're just perpetually collecting things for some of the, the charitable organizations in our community. And to me, those are all ways that we can kind of walk out of this place and we can take whatever it is we've gleaned and gathered and we can go out and be that body of Christ for our community around us. Also, as I look here, I see that, that somebody's not going to be here next week. Oh, it's him. I'll be gone. I'll be gone. So we have an exciting guest speaker here next week, and, and I'll admit, I know absolutely nothing about him, but everything that I have heard from all others that have heard, that have heard him speak and heard him share uh, said that it's a time that we don't want to miss. So I'm not going to tell you to come extra and invite extra because the pastor is gone, so don't hear that <laughs> wrong. Yeah. Don't put that out there. I'm saying come extra and invite others because we have a great opportunity for a great speaker to come and be in our midst. And to bless us. And, and I honestly, I feel bad for Pastor Phil because we often have these great speakers when he's not here and then he misses out. All he ever gets to hear is himself, which is great. But, you know, sometimes it's nice to hear others. So, no, I'm saying he doesn't get to see these great things. So, I don't mean it bad. I mean I'll it be somewhere else. Way. I really will. <laughs> okay. So, we'll hear somebody else elsewhere. But make plans to be here for that and to come in and just to be recharged uh, from whatever it is we've been out being that body of Christ this week in our daily lives. Come and read for us. Rescue me, rescue me. <laughs> <laughs> so this morning's scripture is from the book of Luke in chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing.
commend that scripture to you. And, and I encourage you to read further and kind of get a little sense of what happens after this spot because I think you'll find it's a, a really great kind of telling. And I'll tell a little bit of it as we go through today. Today I want to begin by telling you that there's something about me that you don't know. I guess that's probably true of all of us, right? We all have aspects of our lives that others, uh, it either hasn't come up in conversation or we just um, have just never shared it. It's something that we just don't talk about a whole lot. But I'm going to tell you about something in my childhood. Um, when I was a kid, I was uh, at, at the age of seven, I, I took up a hobby with my best friend, Brian Malinowski. And Brian and I, we were best buddies. We just did everything together. Um, there were lots of things we enjoyed. Like, for instance, down in the basement, we had this play area that had all these wonderful toys all in bins all around us. They were kind of crates. They actually didn't have plastic bins real commonly then, but crates. All, everything had a place. It was all, and then this carpet in the middle, and we wrestled on that carpet, and we wrestled on that carpet. We must have been perfectly matched for each other because it was like we never knew who was going to come out on top in any given wrestling match. It was always an open kind of thing and we did things where we were we played batman and robin and we'd invite all the kids to come see the plays that we prepared and that we wrote and we just all the things that we did but there was one thing that brian and i did together that brought us more kind of enjoyment and fun than anything else we uh enjoyed magic we started out doing magic by getting books from the library and and learning some basic little tricks and some ideas there and and we would then start to buy tricks uh, as well and uh, learn that our partnership our little magical thing together went on for several years Um, Brian and I would eventually part ways because my family moved a hundred miles away and so um, that would be the end of the time of magic for Brian as far as I know I saw Brian one time after that um, we were able to get together. He came to my house where I lived a long ways away. And uh, other than that, I've not had any contact. And I look forward someday to finding Brian. That will be such a great reunion for me. However, while he stopped doing magic, I continued. Uh, my solo act was booked by school groups and, and family gatherings and Cub Scout pack meetings and blue and gold banquets throughout the area. And I did these little magic shows, and I think it was kind of neat the way people were about it. Having a little kid do a magic thing is kind of fun for a group, and so they rather enjoyed that. Over the years, as I grew, my skills improved, and the sophistication of the tricks I was doing improved. Um, The cost of my equipment improved. My father took me to Colon, Michigan, to the International Magic Festival. Colon, Michigan is the... Uh, magic capital of the world, as they'd say, and I'd order tricks through the magic companies there and and others in other locations. And uh, um, it wasn't uncommon for me to have a couple of shows in any given month. It was fun, and the audiences were really, really good to me as a kid. That is except for my friends and those who knew me best. After a show, they'd often mount the stage and anticipate a private explanation, uh, a special insight into how something was done. After all, I was one of them. In a sense, I owed those closest to me uh, a special access or a privilege, the best magic show possible, you know, the the one in which the secrets in the end are revealed. My friends really pressured me. It wasn't enough to say, just sit back and enjoy it and just let it go because it's all about experiencing the moment and just kind of having, in a sense, a trick played on you. Because remember we say it's it's the hands and, and the quickness of the hands that make all the difference in the world. And the hand is quicker, what? Than the eye. Set that aside for just a moment. This week, as we look at the scripture that's before us, there is no shortage of commentary. There are all kinds of books on scripture that help us to understand as we're preparing sermons and all that. And there, are, There's no shortage of others that have written on this subject. Sometimes it's been known as the Nazareth Inaugural, 
it's the time in which we we kind of like hear Jesus's mission statement of what he sees himself as he opens that scroll and he reads from Isaiah. Personally, I love the drama of this entire scene, how he shares that, and later on, the people start to get kind of angry with him. In fact, as you read further, you find that they kind of force him to the edge of town, to a cliff, where it appears they intend to throw him off. Well, you see, Jesus had come home. This was his hometown. And he had gone to the synagogue where he was raised, as as he must have done countless of times when he was little. He was handed the scroll and he opened it to just the right place and then he read. He handed it back to the attendant and he sat down. I love it the way they say that everyone's eyes were fastened on him. Waiting for what was going to come next. There's an intensity there. Even beyond the powerful words that Jesus read from the book of Isaiah, which are very prophetic, he's saying why he's come. And he's saying that in your hearing today, this scripture has been fulfilled. Jesus has spoken. His purpose was crystal clear to himself. But the people of his hometown... Now, they were expecting something, but something more than he gave to the people of the villages out and about, the other places. They wanted special access, privilege. They wanted the best show possible. Maybe the one with the secret revealed in the end. After all, he's our God. There's a story about an elderly couple that had gone to church. And as they're walking out one day, the wife, she says to her husband, did you see the strange hat that Mrs. O'Brien was wearing today? No, I didn't see it, replied the husband. And Bill Smith, he needs a haircut really bad, doesn't he? Commented the wife. Sorry, I didn't notice, replied the husband. You know, John, she said, Sometimes I wonder if you get anything out of going to church. (laughs) Some people get different things out of going to church, don't they? Uh, I guess it probably depends on what we're expecting when we go there, maybe. For example, I wonder what people who had come to the synagogue that day when Jesus was there to speak, I wonder what they were thinking they would get out of the church. My guess is that they were expecting something, but maybe they didn't really fully know what it was. Other than something better than the rumors that had been circulating among them about what Jesus had done other places. In this sense, I also wonder, is the congregation in Nazareth all that different from our own? Or other churches around. Don't we all go to church expecting something? But maybe, maybe for the most part, we really don't take time to articulate what it is we're expecting. Some, I suppose, expect to hear a good sermon. You know, not too long, not too short. Well, maybe not that last part. Short would be okay, right? Some expect to maybe sing some nice familiar songs or hymns and some expect to be welcomed or to see people they know and and gosh, you know, in this church and churches like it, we kind of expect there to be food, maybe cookies or coffee at the at the least, but maybe you know breakfast like we had today, it was so great. But I wonder how many of us go to church really expecting the spirit of God to actually show up. Do we expect good news so good that it might shatter the despair of the poor? Do we expect news so good that it might gain the relief of the imprisoned or the recovery of sight of the blind or or the ending of oppression? Do we expect news so good that it might offer grace and forgiveness? 
And I say that grace and forgiveness part because there's a little bit in this, uh, this quoting of Scripture that I think is important for us to, to underscore, maybe to make some sense of. You, we get the idea of recover your sight to the blind, and, and sometimes we understand what it means that the oppressed are set free. We're oppressed by many things in our world, and they were then too. Not just Rome, but the oppression of things in our lives that hold us back and hold us down. I think we understand what it means that, that people might be set free. And we're imprisoned by many things, sometimes by jail itself and sometimes by the things of our lives in prison. But the last part of that Isaiah passage talks about the acceptable year of the Lord and the Jubilee. It's talking about a 50-year period. Every 50 years, if you had a debt to be erased, slaves would be set free from their masters. It's like a hard reset, the Jubilee. So Jesus is talking about this coming being a time in which the debt is gone, removed. It's the most gracious thing anybody can imagine. Total and utter forgiveness. It's really interesting the way sometimes the code of Scripture kind of hides and obscures some of the most important things. But to the people of Jesus' time, as they would hear him proclaim the Jubilee, they would go, oh, my goodness. Forgiveness and grace. Maybe we think about all these things that Jesus read in this scroll of Isaiah that would come through him. We might even say, you know, Jesus, we're not sure we really want all of that. Maybe we, we'd like to come here and receive a little bit of comfort, a little bit of encouragement, but we're not really interested in something that rocks the boat, the boat of our church, let alone the boat of our lives. So as we look at this story in its larger sense, a story which talks about Jesus saying, here's why I've come. I've come to set people free. It sounds like at the beginning that it's a story about local boy makes good. Everybody sounds on the surface kind of glad to hear that Jesus is there. The miracle worker, our own guy, is here in town. But as soon as he says to them why he's there and he claims the Messiahship, they're not sure at all. And in fact, they're pretty angry. The story which begins, local boy makes good, ends up at the edge of town, at the edge of a cliff. And when they say that in the scripture, what they would do in that time and place is you'd take somebody to the edge of town, to the cliff, and you'd push them off, and they wouldn't die in the fall so much as that was a real easy target then to stone somebody to death. This, my friends, is likely a stoning. But Jesus, as we hear in this passage, at the moment they're ready to throw him off the cliff, he simply walks through the crowd and meets them. Passes right through. Jesus is clear in this passage that he hadn't come to fulfill their longing. Jesus hadn't come to be anybody's lapdog. There was nothing domesticated about this itinerant preacher, Jesus. In no uncertain terms, he told them that he came to serve a mission guided fully and completely by the very will of God, not by the will of people. And this, simply made them mad because they wanted their boy to do what they wanted. And if there was a Messiah, they certainly would have liked the Messiah to be their Messiah, not anything like what he had just described. So the question today for us is how, how does this make us feel? How comfortable are we with this radical rabbi we call our Lord and Savior? And some may say it's okay that Jesus is kind of out there. But lest we forget that being a follower of Jesus means, you know, as we take the name Christian, as we call ourselves Christians, we are followers. It means, well, we're followers emulating the one who leads us. Jesus is out there, friends. Or are we, in some way, shape, or form? 
hard message then. And trust me, if we take it serious, it becomes a hard message for us as well. Because Jesus didn't follow the conventions of his time, and Jesus doesn't follow the conventions of our time either. A willingness to let go of self. To do whatever it takes to serve those in greatest need. Very different from the culture in which he arrived. Nebraska farm life was a little bit like a dream to a seven-year-old Ida Sophia Scudder in the year of the 1880s. There were wide open fields to run through and sweet smelling hay to play in and, and a beautiful horse to take care of. These happy days on the farm almost made her forget what had happened a year before when her family lived in India. Almost, but not quite. It was the children's eyes that were etched forever in her mind. Those rows upon rows of pain-filled eyes, all looking to her for relief. Eyes so weak that they could scarcely be held open. Eyes so full of hunger. Eyes longing to be satisfied. Even though Ida's basket was full to overflowing with bread, she couldn't give them enough to really satisfy their hunger. Her mother had been clear about that. Only one chunk of bread, Ida. Just one chunk for each child. Otherwise, those at the back of the line will get nothing. Yeah, it was hard. But Ida obeyed her mother. One chunk of bread. It wouldn't satisfy these poor children suffering from India's, India's famine at the time, but at least their tummies wouldn't growl quite so loud that night. Well, that night, Ida herself looked at, at her own dinner table and she felt guilty for having so much. And so many had so little. All this was behind her now. Her missionary family had returned to the States because her father had some poor health, and she loved the comforts of America where there always seemed to be plenty of food to go around. It was, it was at the ripe old age of seven that Ida decided never, never would she ever return to India. She wanted to live a, an easier life in a land of plenty. Who can blame her? Now, several years later, while away at college, Ida and her friends, they giggled as they crowded into their secret meeting place, the furnace room there at the college. It was the perfect spot for the bunch to examine their loot. Florence had borrowed the headmaster's pen, and Annie had borrowed the pot from the kitchen in the school, and she said, I have you all beat, Ida exclaimed, as her hand slipped into her pocket. These steel pins came right from the front gate of the college. Just wait until the headmistress comes through the gate today. With that, the entire group broke into laughter. Borrowing <laughs> and then later returning items was just one of the kind of pranks that the bunch pulled during their college years. But now, as graduation was nearing, these young women's thoughts turned towards the conventions of their day, marriage and family, the things that were usual for them. Ida, too, had dreams of a secure life with her own Prince Charming, and it all was in her mind in America. However, her dreams were interrupted by bad news from her parents, who'd since returned to their work in India. Ida's father needed her to come and care for her mother, who was quite ill. Probably the only thing that could have gotten her to say, I'll come, but just to do this. Florence, remember one of her friends in the group, said, you're, you're going to become a missionary just like the rest of your family, your parents and your grandparents before you. She kind of teased. Ida's 
anger flared. Oh, no, I won't. I'll never be a missionary. You'll see. I'll be back in less than a year. After arriving in India, 21-year-old Ida helped her parents in the mission work, but secretly, she was actually planning her escape. One evening, she settled into her room to enjoy a book. As she was turning the pages, her mind was drifting to her plans to return to America, to live out her days in the land of opportunity. The quick footsteps and the knock at her door brought her kind of back to reality and into the present. She looked up to see a a young Hindu man trying to get her attention. My wife is, is having her first baby and something is wrong, he blurted out. I was told that you could help. No, I'm not a doctor, Ida said, but, but my father is. He can help your wife. The young man's face kind of fell into sadness. Our, our religion does not permit a man to even look at, at my wife's face. Ida implored, but, but without my father's help, she may die. In disbelief, Ida watched this man's sad eyes drop to the floor, and he turned And as he was leaving, all she could hear him say was, all is lost. That night, another Hindu man came to Ida with the same request. And and he he refused her father's help. Again, another person for the same reason. And a Muslim man came also seeking help for his pregnant wife. When Ida gave him the same explanation, he replied, if you cannot help me, then... It is better for my wife to die rather than to be seen by a strange man. With that, he bowed and he left. I I just spent a sleepless night that night praying for guidance. In a sense, she felt God's presence in a way she'd never felt it before calling her somehow to follow Jesus. The next morning, she, she learned that, sadly, all three women had died. Not the senseless death, occurring partly because there was no female doctor. Ida prayed aloud this time. God, if you want me to, I will finish this. You know, once she chose to follow, in in one sense, I never looked back. Well, she did return to America, but to attend medical school. She went to Cornell Medical College, and in 1899, Dr. Ida Scudder ready to begin her work as a physician in India. She began her work in a rather unconventional way. It was called the roadside. She had an ox and a wagon full of medical supplies, and Ida traveled to remote villages to treat people where they lived. She'd always prayed with the people she visited, and she asked them if they had any questions about Jesus or about Christianity. She wanted them to know what it was that motivated her to do this extraordinary thing. From there, Ida set her mind to training Indian women as nurses and as doctors so that she could, in a sense, multiply her effect. Though no one believed the women would be able to pass the final doctor's exam. I depressed on anyway. When the scores were finally tallied, all 14 of her first class passed with flying colors. I was dream of teaching the Indian woman to help themselves was becoming a reality in a time that's really hard for us to fully appreciate what she was doing and in a place. It made all the difference in the world. 
Ida helped to start a medical school next there in India. Bellor Christian Medical College and Hospital, which today is an institution that's recognized the world over for its excellent research and its health care and its disease prevention. One story. That's all it is. One person across a great stretch and expanse of time and space. And, and I, I believe, I truly believe that it isn't for everyone to become a missionary. But it is for all who will claim the name Christian to somehow be a follower of Jesus Christ. The one who leads us. But he leads us in a way that's not conventional. He leads us in a way that takes us away from what our culture would tell us and from so many things, messages that are in our lives, in our ears, in our hearts, in our minds. He leads us to bring good news to the poor. Relief to the captives, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, grace. We believe in forgiveness. that make you feel? Are you ready to take Jesus to the edge of the cliff? Or, or your pastor? We got one right over here. <laughs> Let's pray. Gracious God, you challenge us at every turn to be more than we are or more than we understand ourselves to be. Perhaps, Lord, you're trying to remind us of what we really have been all along. Open us to the possibilities of your kingdom. For we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. As we uh, finish service this morning, please stand and join us.
guys are such a gift to us. You know, you don't always know what's going on as things are happening here in the room. And any parent gets a call or a message from their kid, they're always glad. And I'm preaching today, and my pad, you know, picks up everything that I'm doing for my phone. And so as I'm speaking to you, my son is sending me this picture from Manhattan in New York. These are cars. And so I had trouble just kind of not seeing uh, everything I was supposed to see, but was I glad to hear from Matt that he's good and everything. Friends, we go from this place and we give thanks to God for all 